come to take place. Sally Clark walked free yesterday after the appeal court ruled that not only was her trial jury misled by flawed statistics, but more crucially, vital evidence was withheld. Pathologist Dr. Alan Williams, who carried out post-mortem examinations on both children, had said there were no obvious causes of death, yet it later emerged that he knew of a potentially fatal bacterial infection. Dr. Williams was not at home today, but the General Medical Council is investigating whether he is guilty of incompetence or worse. 38-year-old Angela Canning is another mother jailed for murdering two of her children. Her family say she too is not guilty. If Sally Clark is innocent, then that makes Angela doubly innocent. So obviously the impact of yesterday's verdict, I've not forgot that in three years. Um, and I just hope now that something will come right for Angela. Five News has made no attempt to talk directly to Sally Clark after she appealed for privacy, but her solicitor told me the victory is still sinking in. Sally Clark is a lovely, compassionate, thinking individual who has a husband who's devoted to her. She is devoted to him. That surely must give them strength. This is no longer the Clark family home. It was sold to pay legal fees. Now Sally Clark may sue those whose blunders, she believes, led a mother grieving the loss of two children being unjustly accused of their murders. Ben Ando, Cheshire, 5 News. Well, tonight, six other mothers remain in prison for killing their babies. But could they too be miscarriages of justice, similar to Sally Clark? Well, still with me in the studio, James Hardy, Nick Ferrari, also joining us for this debate, uh, Joyce Epstein, who's the director of the Foundation for the Study of Infant Death. And on the line, uh, Sally Clark solicitor, John Batt. John, uh, thank you for joining us on the program. If I could start with you, um, a lot of people this evening, I imagine, will be thinking to themselves, how much uh, should we credit now um, those expert witnesses, those pathologists who come in and give us uh, decisions on what's happened to people, uh, particularly infants, when they've died? Do you think the whole thing is up for question now? Well, the first thing I've got to say is that the appeal court made it absolutely clear yesterday that the decision was unique to the facts in Sally's case. Um, Sally's case was unique in two respects. It's the first time in our history, to my knowledge, that a lawyer has ever been convicted of a double murder. Uh, and in this case, a woman lawyer, it's not a sexist remark, I'm just pointing out the, the, the fact that this was a mother uh, who was uh, convicted of a double murder. And it is the first time that a double murder conviction has been overturned on the basis of the withholding from the trial and from the other experts a report which demonstrated virtually beyond doubt that one of the two babies died from natural causes. So that puts it into a very special category. On but what, what I'm wondering, John, is, is does the, what's happened in this case uh, lead us to, to think that it could be happening in many other cases? I mean, we, we've mentioned some of the, one of the other cases um, at the moment that's now being questioned. Is, is that right, do you think? Should we be yeah. following on? I, I, absolutely. This is absolutely right. Uh, I have made contact with a number of people who are either awaiting trial on very similar charges or who have actually been convicted. And there are two factors in common in all of the cases. There is no history of abuse by the mother or the father accused, and there are accusations from experts in child abuse who say, who give basically profiling evidence. We've compared the behavior of this defendant with the behavior of other defendants in similar circumstances who have been convicted of murder, and you may think that, therefore, these deaths cannot be natural. Now, that uh, approach is actually forbidden by English law. You are not allowed to give evidence that a defendant has a propensity uh, to commit an offense. Uh, now, that evidence was given in Sally's case, and that evidence was given in Angela Canning's case as well. John, can I stop you there for a moment? Joyce, if I could bring you on, in on this one. Do you, do you share John, John's fears that what's happened in this case may well have happened in many other cases? I certainly know that there are systemic problems with the way uh, these kinds of cases are dealt with. Sorry, systemic problems Sorry. is one of those <laughs> phrases. What, what does that actually mean? I mean that there are problems in the whole system in how sudden infant death 
is investigated in this country. Give me an idea. What, where, where does it go wrong? Well, for one thing, it should be the case uh, that every baby that dies in this way should be seen by somebody who knows something about baby diseases, a pediatric pathologist. Are you saying that do that doesn't happen? In only one third of the cases are babies seen by a baby specialist. And the result, research shows, is that the diagnosis is wrong in at least 20% of the cases. So that's the first thing. Um, we need to have pediatric pathologists. Um, but we need, we, we've heard this um, uh, a few days ago in the Victoria Clan Bay. We need to have all the professionals involved, the police, the doctors, the health visitor, the GP, the pathologist, everybody who's involved with that baby and that family has to sit around a table with a checklist. Did we do this? Did we do this? Did we do this? Did we look at this bit of information, that bit of information? What was the outcome? Come on, let's come to some conclusion as to why that baby died. James, I mean, it seems staggering to me, and I think we're all on quite a fast learning curve about how these things actually come about, that a lot of what you're talking about sounds like common sense, mm. that we, I, I would have assumed that that was happening. Well, I think the, the, the problem with the system at the moment is that the defence takes on its own experts, the prosecution takes on its experts. There's a, there's a tendency on the prosecution experts sometimes to, to find what the police are looking for. Um, I'm not sure whether it's happened in this case. Uh, Joyce may have a better idea than me. Um, but certainly, going right back to the 70s when um, the forensic scientist Frank Scoose uh, effectively convicted the Birmingham Six, and we all know what happened as a result of that. There's been a, this problem with defence, uh, with, with expert witnesses. I think there's possibly a way out of this um, offered in the current criminal justice bill, which David Blunkett is putting through Parliament, because for the first time, the prosecution will have to give all its evidence to the defence. So everything will have to be disclosed. Yes. I think in this case, that crucial medical evidence would have become... John, can I, can I bring you in on this one? I mean, uh, the, I, I remember... Can I say first of yes, all sir, sure. that the, the clerks, having had one cot death, pleaded for the, the police to appoint a paediatric pathologist. Mm. The paediatrician at the hospital who admitted Harry uh, when he had died pleaded for a paediatric pathologist. The police completely overruled that and said Dr. Williams is a perfectly adequate general pathologist to do this work, and he carried out the autopsy. So on what grounds did they, they overrule that? I mean, why, why, why was it that they said, you know, they would decide who, who to use? Well, I, I can only... Well, there are two grounds. There's, first of all, the ground of cost, and there is, second, the, 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 the ground that we don't have enough paediatric pathologists. There aren't enough to go round. So the suggestion was they kind of didn't have an expert they could use? Well, Nick, this is it's quite scary, this, oh, isn't it? Listen, Charlie, if this wasn't so appalling, it, it would be farcical. We have a legal system now. I ask your viewers just to cast their minds back. Four weeks ago, a career burglar with a string of convictions as long as his proverbial arm was allowed out of prison because he wanted to write poetry. Last week, somebody wasn't sent to prison because he was a drug addict and it was feared his habit would come back if he went into prison. Instead, we are locking up women for life for wrongly being accused of murdering their two children. And what's another appalling part is that the person of whom we speak, the pathologist, as mentioned earlier in your report, if there is an inquiry by his own medical body, and we don't know if that will happen, who will sit in judgment of the doctor? Other doctors. It gives the public no confidence whatsoever in that inquiry panel. Joyce? Um, one of the things I wanted to say is... Uh, you, you asked why, why was a pediatric pathologist not selected, and I certainly agree with the two reasons that we've just now heard from Mr. Bat, but one of the main things is there's such a high level of suspicion now when, when a cot death occurs that that's why the investigation feels it has to turn to a forensic or home, op home office pathologist because they're looking for wrongdoing. A pediatric pathologist is looking for disease but the Home Office pathologist is looking for evidence of wrongdoing. So why, why is there increased suspicion now? What's changed? Um, I think it's partly because of the original Sally Clark trial um, attracted an awful lot of publicity. It was a terrible shock horror story. Caught death mother found to be guilty. And there were headlines all over about killer parents lurking in all the nurseries and people literally getting away with murder, according to the newspapers. Uh, and the level of suspicion just zoomed way up. And we know not everybody ends up in, in a trial and in jail, but we know that um, bereaved parents 
are getting treated in some ways just appallingly with because of suspicion. They're they're treated like criminals. Can, John, can I ask you that one? Because yes, obviously you you've been very indeed. close. You you've, can't stop me talking about well, that. You've been you've been very close to the family. I mean, can you give us some examples of, of what you know how they were treated, of what happened during the course of this? Well, they were treated as as been said with complete suspicion. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. Every sudden unexpected death of an infant has got to be properly investigated, not only to make sure that no wrongdoing happened, but also to try and identify the cause of the death. Because no parent wants to hear that it's been the, its baby has died a cot death from some unknown cause. Mothers automatically blame themselves when anything goes wrong with their baby. If the baby dies, they will automatically be saying, it must have been something I did or left undone. But the, the other part of this, the, the main reason for the suspicion is because Professor Sir Roy Redo has been saying over and over again, one cot death is a tra tragedy, two cot deaths are suspicious, and three are murder until the contrary is proved. Okay, John, I, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Joyce, can I ask you, because I think I heard earlier today a quote from you about these very figures, of the, uh, which I found extraordinary, about the numbers of families where two deaths do occur yeah. of, of, of very yeah. small babies. It, it's not as rare as, uh, as um, Professor Meadows said in his, in his evidence that was one in 73 million. <coughs> we actually, at my, a foundation for the study of infant deaths, follow up families when they've had a baby die through to the next baby. So we have lots of, observ you know, real, we've observed what actually happens. And in our experience, a cot death family will have another baby die approximately once a year in this country. So it's still pretty rare but it's not as if it never happens. Okay, Nick, I, I wanna, we're on the wind-up now. Yeah, I'm wondering what, what can positively come out of this. P possibly the publicity can make the authorities treat people with less suspicion. I think so, and I think when I say that Sally Clark was lucky, of course she's not lucky. She suffered untold tragedy, which I can't imagine, but she's a very articulate woman. She had a very supportive husband. She clearly got very good legal advice and legal guidance, and for that we can all give thanks. I just fear that some of these other women of whom we're talking are, I don't want to be demeaning, but check out girls who are not as articulate, as not as well educated, and can't defend themselves as well. What happens to them? Okay, we will have to leave that one there. Joyce, big thank you for you for joining us. Yeah. Now, still to come on 5 News. What do the Queen, Michael Jackson and Mirtha Titville have in common? Before that, more of tonight's top stories. Police investigating the murder of Millie Dowler could be one step closer to finding her killer. The DNA found after a burglary in a church in Sunderland matches with DNA found on Millie's clothing. Her body was discovered in a wood in Hampshire. An eight-year-old schoolgirl has been crushed to death by a fallen tree.